the biggest thing as far as struggle wise this year is you've got a crop that you really nationwide that you really have no idea what it is I mean you've got so many different challenges I'm gonna put my I'm gonna, hold on stand by let me plug my MC belt in. Don't hate me. good lord see if I could have ears all of them like that I'd be driving a new truck boys So you take all of these, the way they're positioned in the row, see, look at this. Perfect example, this thing is at least 20 around. So you take an ear like this. Now this is an outside row, of course. But you take this outside row in the context of our strip intercrop, okay? Whereas we're averaging 16 around This one is 20 around. So you've got a 25% increase in rows around and you can say, well, we're only going to, the kernels are smaller. The thing is, in this case, the kernels are gonna build out. So on a 16 where they fill the gaps and then they come out, the 20 where the gaps are already filled, they're just gonna come out. So that's why when you look at something like this and you say, well, 16 around, 20 around, what's the matter, they're the same size right now. Well they probably are the same size right now. But what you're gonna find is later in the season this 20 more than likely will have built more out. So in the context of the strip intercrop that's where this shines because even if you have a less than perfect stand which this one is and a lot of the outside row is. Now let's say you take a perfect stand you put full sunlight on it for more than half the day and you give it basically the best growing conditions that you can give it. How many outside rows can we get? Because those outside rows are what's gonna drive your field average. Now at the end of the day, the field average is what matters. But if we can, the more of these outside rows that we can make 400, 500 bushel on that we have, the higher our field average is gonna be just by default. So that's why this is exciting. You've got, you know, we take the average ear on the inside of our fields is a 16 and we're turning that into a 20 simply by putting it on the outside row. So that, that's why this strip intercrop is so exciting and that's why you know, if we can fix the problems with it, which the, there, are, there are many problems, if we can fix those problems, this becomes a game changer. And in, in all reality, what it does is it makes, if you do this enough, it makes anybody who's not doing it completely uncompetitive. But We've got to fix the problems. And like I said, that's that's a process. It's not gonna be an overnight thing. So but if we can do it, this is a game changer. Boom! Get it! Cut! Get it, man! Cut! Next scene. And moving on. <laughs> I like that. Director credit from that one. That's a big deal, though. It's a huge deal. That sounds like it's a, it's a, almost it's like a giant. For some... I mean, you take it. Okay, let's take let's take the average field. You make 250 bushel, which is kind of pedestrian now, right? Right. You take a 250 bushel pedestrian yield. Okay. Average every day, only farmer goes out and plants, goes on vacation, comes back, harvests. Okay. In some cases, some places. Okay, which. There's areas around here you can do that. You can do that. The right year, 250 bushel corn. Okay. Let's say, and that's let's easy figuring. Let's say the corn's four dollars. Okay. So you've just grossed a thousand dollars an acre. You have to take all of your expenses off of those. Now, let's say you take a strip intercrop situation, and you say we're going to go from a 250 bushel average to a 350 bushel field average. Okay which is about what an irrigated guy, you know, most of the irrigated guys that I talk to, which are admittedly, you know, good growers, but your average irrigated guy, well, not average, the irrigated guys that I talk to, okay, have farm averages around the 370 bushel mark, okay? So if we say we can go in dry land with no irrigation cost, with no, no more land cost, with no more equipment cost, except for more trucking and more hours on the combine because it takes longer. 
okay? If we can take all of those fixed costs and cut, spread them over the same amount of bushels. Now let's take dollars. You add another 100 bushels, so that's $400. All of a sudden you're grossing $1,400. You're essentially spending little more money. Your cost per bushel plummets in that situation because all of your fixed costs remains the same. So in a situation where a lot of guys are not are breaking even or barely making money, you know, where the market is now, that becomes a game changer because all of a sudden nobody can compete with you. You can blow anybody out of the water as far as dollars per acre wise, which means to a certain extent, okay, you can grow as much as you want to. And as the it's just like compound interest. The more bushels you raise, the more acres you pick up. The more acres you pick up, the more bushels you raise back and forth, back and forth, and all of a sudden, you know, the financial constraints of farming, which are substantial, um, become less of a problem, so. Maybe there'd be more farmers then. I think there, I think it actually results in less farmers. Oh, okay. Because, and the reason for that is, you know, to a certain extent, we only need so much corn. So let's say Matt Swanson goes out and raises 350 bushel corn. That doesn't change the global supply market, okay? But let's say 10% of guys in Illinois start doing it. That changes the supply market in the globe because Illinois is like the sixth largest producer of corn in the world. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's a change, okay? So it does, it would put, put, a, put, put the U.S. in a situation where some of the guys whose cost per bushel is higher because either they don't live outside the corn belt or they're just not a low-cost producer, it puts them in a, in, a, in a bad situation, which, you know, that's kind of the law of supply and demand. The more supply you have, the less demand you, you know, the less people it takes to fulfill that demand. So, I mean, there's something to be said that if we have a big pile of corn and corn's $1.50, people are going to find ways to use it. Yeah. That's going to happen, okay? But... But the, the thing with the strip intercropping is it's a labor intense process and it's a high management process. I'm not sure that it's something you can do on 3,000 acres if it's just you and a couple other guys like most, you know, 3,000 farmer, 3,000 acre guys are in this area. I, it's not something that you can do on that scale, I think, and have any time whatsoever. You know, you're going to be so busy doing this and doing that because you're, the size of your equipment is smaller, but I, I don't know that it's something that's just going to catch fire. Yeah. So how much, I mean, you say it's more time and more management, how much? Well, I mean, if you take it, for me, it's not a, it's not a big jump because, because we're already busy all year doing something. But for the average guy in my area that's gonna that's gonna work his ground, he's gonna plant, he's gonna spray, you know, and if he doesn't have livestock, they're not gonna do a whole lot during the summer. I mean, they're gonna go on vacation, they're gonna get their equipment ready for harvest, they're gonna do some of these other things, whereas even us in our high yield situation, let's, I mean, let's completely dis you know, disregard the strip intercrop. In our high yield session, we're making so many passes that we're, we don't ever stop. I mean, my sprayer has basically not stopped moving for more than two days outside of rain since April. It's now almost August. So April, May, June, July, I mean, that's four months of basically running constant. So the strip intercrop changes that because of the size of the strips. There are some things that you can do across the strips and there are some things you can't. So you're covering less acreage per hour and even at harvest same thing so it's going to limit to a certain extent the the adoption rate of that just because there are so many challenges i mean you got weeds you got time you've got equipment size you've got all these things and the problem is there's a point at which the strips are too big to make a difference and let's say that point is you know just over 40 foot well there's a lot of equipment now that's 60 foot or 120 foot. Jeez. So, if the strips are only 40 foot wide and you can't cover multiple strips at one time, then you know that's going to limit the adoption. Right. Because what about the amount of uh, spraying and time that you put into it, isn't there a cutoff as far as like where it's not profitable? 
Well, it depends on what you're doing. I mean, as long as the pass you're making is profitable, then just keep making them. Um, the problem is that a lot of passes are not profitable if they're not done correctly, if they're not... The thing about a lot of what we do on the high yield side is, you know, it's almost as much about timing as it is about the product. It's almost so much about timing as it is about the, you know, the growth stage or the fertility. It's just having the right timing. So, obviously, um, because of weather constraints, because of equipment size, there's so many things that you're, you're time sensitive on that you can only cover so many acres. And that's, um, it becomes a consideration, you know, some of these guys that are working on robotics and ag and unmanned vehicles, uh, unmanned equipment, you know, where it's smaller, okay, that's a possible solution to this problem. If we can put five robots out that cost twelve, fifteen thousand dollars a piece as opposed to one sprayer that costs a hundred thousand dollars and they can work 24 or 23 hours a day let's call it that changes the game okay um, but that's a little ways off so in the future well I'm gonna go get a Gatorade you guys going or are you staying um we are oh you're going to the store to get a Gatorade I'm gonna go to the store and get a Gatorade we have Gatorades you have Gatorades we have yellow and red right yeah we have yellow now we have a specific flavor you're down to, well, I don't want to, if you're running out, I don't want to run you out. No, I was wondering if you can have. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Welcome to have a Gatorade. Well, let's pull in, and then we can have a Gatorade break. Sounds like a plan. And then we can go spray some beans. Smart. No, it's not like a giant Gatorade. That's fine.